Amen. So, Father, our ears are open. You said you would open our ears. Our ear, our eyes are open. You said you would open our eyes. You said you would part the sea. And so we fully expect you to be glorified. Let us hear your word today. So if you have your Bibles, or as I like to often do when I'm out and about, if you have your phone, turn to Genesis 13, and the Holy Spirit is going to talk to us. I'll be quoting some out of New American Standard in case your version doesn't line up. A little bit out of King James, and I might even quote a little bit out of First Bernie chapter 10 or 2 or something. Amen? Are y'all having fun? You know, we should have fun when we get together. The world is crazy, we know that, but it's all sovereign. God hasn't fallen off of his throne, and we should rejoice. Rejoice, rejoice, because I will guarantee you some of the upheaval we are seeing is just God turning things right side up. Amen. Amen. So Abram, verse 1, Genesis 13, Abram went up from Egypt to the south land, he and his wife and all that belonged to him and Lot with him. Now Abram was very rich in livestock and silver and in gold. He went on his journeys from the south land as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning, between Bethel and Ai, to the place of the altar that he had made there formerly. And there Abram called on the name of the Lord. Now you're gonna hear us, we're gonna talk about Abram today as Abram, not Abraham, because his name had not yet been changed, all right? So, and I'm going to do that on purpose because to really grasp what God's doing, we have to know where Abram is right now. And this is where he was. His name had not yet been changed. God had spoken to him back in Genesis 12, which I think is amazing, and said, get up, move, and go over here. I'm not going to tell you where you're going, but I'll tell you eventually. Now, come on, ladies. How well do you do with something like that? <laughs> sure, let's go. Abraham, or Abram, what's the, I, I got to catch right. So Abram goes home and he looks at Sarah and says, we're moving. We are? Yeah, we're moving. When? Now, where are we going? Don't know. <laughs> All right, men, I hear you laughing, Tommy. How well would she do that? Right? Not too well. But the amazing, but they have done it. They have done it. God has said to them, right? Get up and move. And they said yes. So that's us. I'm glad you're right here. I'll pick on you. Yeah, because you won't snarl too bad. Everybody else is going to snarl. All right. So Abram, think about it. He had heard the voice of the Lord go forth. And this is amazing because he is in a world of idol worshipers. There's no infrastructure. We come in, we go, don't you love Jesus? And 50 people go, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, and we're praising the Lord, and we're carrying on. There was no framework. He didn't know who God was. Nobody over there knew, knew, knew who God was. He was in Ur. How'd you like to be from Ur? Hi, I'm from Ur. <laughs> He's in Ur of the Chaldees. Hello, remember the Chaldeans? Remember Nebuchadnezzar and the big gold statue? Yeah, that's their heritage. So that's where Abraham is. Whoops. Abram, thank you. So that's where Abram is, and he gathers up everything to do exactly what the Holy Spirit said do. It says that he was very rich. Now, it's not like you can go down to H-E-B. We got 200 feet people to feed. We can run over to Sam's. We can go to H-E-B. No, no, no. You carry your herds, your stock, your livestock, your all the... Hello. Karen Elliott. If, since you are so blessed, you too get to travel with 200 chickens. <laughs> I mean, really, they had to bring their food supply. They are bringing everything. It's a huge undertaking. And so he, he does. He gathers it all up. 
He brings Lot with him, and there's a whole message in that we'll touch on in a minute. And he gets down to Egypt. He says, you know what? I think I'm in trouble here. And he says, you know, Pharaoh, Sarah's really pretty. You can have her for a while. And it got him in a lot of trouble, remember? So he says, I'm in trouble. This is not good. And so he... Pharaoh sends him away, and in chapter 13, Abram does something amazing, and he sets a precedent and a pattern for us. Abram goes back to the last altar he made. He went back to the last place he knew God was. And you know what? All of, I don't care how, you know, come on. We all want y'all to, and we all want the other person to think we are just deep and spiritual and anointed and prophetic and la la la. And let me tell you what, welcome to being human because we're not always all we want you. You know, Lord Jesus, make me the person my dog thinks I am. Please. But it, hey, we can all get off track. And in our society, it's called distracted. Anybody ever been distracted? Yeah. Anybody ever want to throw your cell phone in the trash can? I have dumped mine in the toilet before. Yeah. It'll take it out. So we get distracted and God is pulling on Abram and he goes back to the last place. He knew he had encountered the presence Selah. He went back to the last place he knew he had encountered the presence of Almighty God. And it was an altar and it was between a city called Bethel and a town called Ai. Now, Bethel, most of us know, means the house of God. But AI, and boy, could we have fun preaching about AI? Yes. We could. There's a million sermons now about AI. But let me tell you about AI. AI means a heap of ruins. And oftentimes, we have an altar built, but we are caught in between the house of God. And a heap of ruins. Wow. Shall I just stop here, Beverly? <laughs> just give the altar call. Okay, we're good. And if y'all don't know Beverly McGuire, y'all need to know this lady. She is full of the Spirit of God. All right. What did he do? He went back to the last place he knew there was a, there was something there, and he built another altar. Thank you. He didn't use the same old altar he had last time. Yeah. He built himself a new altar. He, uh, that is the word of the Lord for somebody. I am telling you, it's so we have to tear down the old altars. They may have been good for where we were, but they're not good now. The anointing that worked for yesterday, I am telling you, a little tiny bucket of anointing is not going to work today. The altar that we have to do has to be built now. The sacrifice has to be now. The hurt sometimes has to be now. The cost has to be now. You can't just run on what you committed yesterday. Abram built a new altar and he did what? He called on the name of the Lord like he had never called on him before because he had no idea where he was. Sound familiar? And you know what? A lot of us have been walking with God for a long, long time. And if we're really honest, in this new era, we don't quite know where we are. We don't quite know where we are. Build a new altar. Make a new sacrifice and call on the name of the Lord. Now Lot, who went with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents, verse 5. And the land could not sustain them while they're dwelling together, for their possessions were so great. 
So there was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. And Abram said to Lot, please, don't you love it? NASB puts the word please. That's really sweet. Most of us would be, look, youngin, you're messing with my herds and my food supply. You need to get on out of here. Okay, no, no, no. Listen to Abram. It's fascinating. Please. Please. And the first thing he says is, let there be no strife between you and me, nor between, not just us, but between my herdsmen and your herdsmen. All the extended, we don't want any strife. That second altar call's coming, baby. I'm telling you. For we are brothers. Is not the whole land before you. Please separate from me. Now, separating is one of the things that we have so much difficulty with. Anybody here ever had to lay something down and walk away besides me? Oh, look, we have 10 honest people in here. Everybody, we all have. Everybody, we've all had, some of us have had to lay down some very big things. Some of us have had to lay down what looks good. Come on, y'all. It's not always sin we have to lay down. In fact, the hardest thing to lay down is that calling you're sure God gave you. Father, please help us. It's getting very quiet in this Presbyterian gathering. Sometimes the most important thing we have to lay down is the call we are sure God gave us. And if you don't believe it, ask Abraham about laying down Isaac. Okay? So the promise, sometimes the highest thing we can do with the promise is lay it down. So Abram looks at Lot here, and he says, I want you to separate from me. Well, most of us want security and safety and comfort and consistency, and very few people will purposefully I love this phrase. Are you ready? Holy Spirit gave, gave this to me. I'm going to share it with you. Very few people will forsake the familiar. Yeah. That's what I said. Wow. So I'm going to pass it on to you. Very few people will forsake the familiar. But then Abram does an amazing thing. He completely surrenders his status as the elder person in the relationship. He tells Lot, choose for yourself. Where do you want to go? What? Yeah, he actually did that. Hello? Amazing. The ability to walk in humility and really trust God's sovereignty is on full display in Abram at this very second. And instead, he says, you pick where would you like to go? Now remember, Abram has the call, Abram has the promise, and he says to Lot, choose the left or the right. It doesn't matter to me. If you choose the left, I'll go to the right. If you choose the right, I'll go to the left. Now, I don't know about you guys, but how many of y'all would ever say, you know, I'm supposed to speak today, but yeah, I just feel like Lueda may have a word, so let's just see if Lueda wants to preach. Because <laughs> I'll guarantee you, she could come up here and we could tag team and have a blast, okay? And then we'll start handing the microphone to Tommy and we'll just have a party. the gifting. And we don't. We don't. G 
Jesus never gives anything apart from himself. It's not your gift. Sorry. It's not your gift. It's packaged in him. You abide in him. Therefore, you, the sacrifice, you, the altar, you, the being laid down, becomes the gift of God to the people. Amen. Amen. So, why did he really? I don't know. Never heard that before. Let's see if Holy Spirit will give it back. That one's not in the notes at all. But think about it. So the gift, Jesus never gives anything apart from himself. So it's not my gift. Where is every gift? In him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Every gift is in him. And where do I abide? In him. Where does he abide? In me. Therefore, I, if I am truly surrendered, I become the sacrifice to feed you. And whatever form God wants that to take. Oh, sorry. Got a medal, Elizabeth. Whatever, oh, this is so important, y'all. Whatever form God wants that to take, whether it's sweeping the floor, standing in the back, cleaning the toilet, standing up here with a microphone, it doesn't matter. What matters is obedience to what Spirit of the Lord has said for us to do at that time. You can't, you can't, I can't, go too low. We can't. We can't go too low. We, we can't. You cannot out-humble God. I cannot out-humble God. Blessed be the Lord our God who dwells on high, Psalm 113, 5 and 6, who humbles himself to behold the things that are in heaven and in earth. The Father has chosen to humble himself. Jesus, found in fashion as a man, did what? Humbled himself. And he became a man. He became an obedient man. Then he became a dead man. And he had to wait for the Father to resurrect him, right? And what does Holy Spirit do? He speaks what he hears. All of the Trinity is a picture of divine humility. And where does that divine humility dwell? In the high and holy place with him who is also of a contrite and humble spirit. Isaiah 57, 15. Oh, we want to be in the heavenlies. God says, good, go low. Lord, we want a revelation. Good, sweep the floor. Yeah, amen. And we, you know how difficult this is for us because when somebody like me gets up here and preaches it, which I really don't like to do it because that means when I go home, I gotta walk it. I'm telling you, God doesn't let me. You know, some preachers they just get up, they sound so good. Are you kidding? God doesn't let me get away with anything. If I'm not walking, I mm, mm, I hear about it big time. So we go low, we go low, we go low. This is exactly what Abraham did when he said, "Lot, go go wherever you want to go. You do what you want." Now, it's really interesting. What is the real reason that they had to separate? Well, see, Abram's name means exalted father. Eventually, God would call him Abraham, which is a father of a multitude. Abram's name did not yet reflect his true destiny. And where we are right now, individually and corporately, we have not yet seen, Cynthia yeah. Vela, the destiny that the Holy Ghost has on you guys. You have not seen it. We haven't seen it. His name wasn't different yet. He wasn't walking into his full destiny yet. But as fast as he had the revelation he had, he walked in obedience. He had established a pattern of listening to the voice of God. Oh, listen closely. Listening first, building altars, offering sacrifices, and calling on the name of the Lord. He had a purposeful surrender. Oh yeah, well I, I surrendered to Jesus back when I was a teenager. 
uh huh, did we surrender to him this morning? Now I'll really meddle with me. Am I surrendered to him now? I mean, like right this second, think about it. What if God says, what if he says that? See, so are we surrendered now? Is it a now sacrifice? Is it a now heart crumbled, if I can word it that way? So even a casual look at Abraham tells us he's a, he is a man of vision. I mean, he is a man of vision. You don't do what Abram did if you aren't a person of vision. Now we know the word of the Lord is extremely emphatic. It's where there is no vision, the people perish. Well, how's your vision? How new is your vision? So yesterday's vision, last week's vision. Come on, let's pick on a glow a little. 55 year ago vision. Thank you. See, it doesn't work. You can't do it. Who? Okay, unless you're a classic car nut. Who wants to drive an Edsel? <laughs> or do you want to get in the one you drove? How about this? Let's go way back. Who wants to try to ride my horse over here? <laughs> if you can ride him, you can have him. <laughs> Abram is a man. Vision and the word vision literally means to gaze at, perceive, contemplate, and it can also be translated. Are you ready? Prophesy. We really start seeing, and I'll tell you, the word of the Lord will start flowing. Yeah. Now, Lot, Lot's also with Abraham or Abram. I'm working on it, y'all. Thanks for your patience. He had flocks and herds and tents. Now, let me tell you, just because we have overflowing, abundant blessing doesn't mean we have vision. Abundant blessing is not necessarily a sign of the approval of Almighty God. Abundant blessing is not necessarily a sign of the approval of Almighty God. And I can prove it. Bill Gates is very wealthy. I rest my case. <laughs> now let's not be too judgmental about Abram bringing Lot along. I mean, we all know God said go and don't bring anything with you, etc., etc. But like I said, there's no HEB around the corner, and somebody's got to feed all those workers. And you know, I don't think Sarah has a kitchen big enough to do that. But here's the problem. Sometimes it feels like things are needed, but they're not. Elizabeth, I was going to use you in this illustration, and I think I will. I took it out of my notes. But because I'm in front of all these witnesses, she can't kill me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you'll understand and I think you'd be okay I mean really how many suitcases do you have to break <laughs> okay now let me shift it back to all of us before y'all pick on Elizabeth too much how many of y'all have ever sat on a suitcase? <laughs> Woo, Jesus, look at all these liars. <laughs> I release you from that spirit of lying in the name of Jesus. Come on, how many times have you got, okay, you're going to move, right? You're going to move. You pack all this stuff in the boxes and you're going to move. And you load them up and the movers take them if you're lucky or if you're not so blessed, you get a U-Haul and you, <clears throat> and you get all your friends and you put all the stuff in the box and off you go. And then you get there and life is really busy. So you know that spare bedroom? <laughs> now I'm meddling. You know all the boxes in them? In that spare bedroom? And you go digging through looking for the stuff you really need? And after 
after a year, you go on, you know, that neat Christmas stuff, and you come out and you start, oh, I bet it's in one of those boxes in the spare bedroom. And so off you go. Now, here's what's happened. You just spent a year without stuff you thought you needed. Oh, shall we make the spiritual application? How many trappings do we haul along? thinking we have to have this, have to know, oh, we're Gentiles, y'all. We have to know everything, we think. No, we don't. We have to hear from the Holy Spirit what we need to know. So we drag all this stuff that we don't really need. Here's the most important thing about Lot. If you don't hear anything I say today but this, Lot's name means... Veil. Lot's name means veil. Oh, or covering. Veil, covering. Abram was a man of vision. He had the anointing. He had the call of God. And everywhere he went, he was dragging a veil behind him. He was, he's anointed, but he's still dragging a veil behind him that he thinks he needs. Thank you, Jesus. It means a covering. Are you ready? It means an envelope. You know, envelopes can be sealed shut. It's an envelope. Are you ready? It also means to wrap up tightly and envelop. In other words, the veil will blind, listen closely, the veil will blind our vision so we cannot see the spiritual eyes. And that veil wrapped around us too tightly will bind us so we are not free to follow Jesus as he truly is leading. Just like Lazarus, who was raised from the dead, but had what wrapped around him? Oh yeah, that veil of grave clothes. Jesus raised him from the dead, but then he told everybody else to loose him and let him go, right? So the veil... Abram is a man of vision and he's dragging a veil. So let's meddle now. What does my veil look like? Well, I've been in the church for 45 years. That's a terrible veil. I know how to hear God. That's a very scary veil. See, I don't have to worry about, Raleigh, can I pick on you? I don't have to worry about finding Raleigh down at the bar tonight, okay? Because she already told me she has to be in Kerrville, okay? But I don't need to worry about finding her at the bar tonight. Maybe next week, but not, no, no, no. I'm never going to find Raleigh at the bar. Why? Because that's not a temptation for Raleigh. But the, we've always done it this way. And I know how to hear God. And I know how to pray for the sick. And I'm not saying all those things are wrong. This is a new era. Let go of religious veils. And let's see what God really wants to do. Because he'll take the religious veil in the temple. And he's going to split it in two from the top to the bottom. Not just so we can get in. But so he can get out of what we have been trapping him in. Let the veil go. No matter how good it looks. No matter how religious. No matter how anointed we think it is. But it was Elijah's mantle. I don't care if it was Jesus' shroud of Turin. Let it go and follow what Holy Spirit is telling you to do. And you will walk in things you never dreamed of. Let the veil go. So what is our veil like? Remember, if a veil is too thick, it may not just blur your vision, it might actually blind you completely. If it is tightly wrapped around you, you may not be able to move at all. 
God's just not moving me anywhere. Well, how tight is that veil wrapped around us? You see? So that tightness, even of, oh, yes, even of the good. There's a big difference between good and God. You know what it is? It's revelation. It's when we say, oh, and we take out that extra oh. Good God. When we get a revelation, what do we usually go? Oh, take it out. That revelation of that extra O, get rid of it. It's not, we don't need good. We need God. We need revelation. Sometimes the things we have to let go might be relationships. They might be things that we think we know are good. They might be things that we've, oh, surely God would never tell me to lay that down. Yeah, he would. Come on, if God Almighty would lay Jesus down. If Abram would lay Isaac down, hello, if Jesus would lay himself on the cross, God withheld nothing from us. How shall he not freely with him then what? Give us all things. So if he was willing to lay down Jesus, why do we hold so tightly to what we perceive as good? So when the revelation of Almighty God begins to come, ah, we can be liberated. We can be unbound. We can be, have the veil taken off of our eyes. Now, what happens when the vision and the veil decide they're going to live together? Not good. Amen. Genesis 13.5. The land cannot bear it. The land cannot bear it. Your spiritual earth, your soul, your spirit, your body, your being, your, just individually speaking, the land, your land, your territory, where has God told you to be? cannot bear the vision and the veil trying to live together. The land cannot sustain because what fellowship does light have with darkness? And that veil, no matter how good it looks, will bring darkness. It brings darkness. We have to let anything that God puts his finger on go. Let it go, let it go. Or like we sang in the board meeting the other day, Kathy, let it go, let it go, let it go. We are writing a new Christmas carol. Let it go. Let it go. Our promised territory cannot sustain the vision and the veil living together. Secondly, there is always strife when we try to have the vision and the veil living together. Because we're always trying to make everybody happy. I bet nobody else in here has ever been caught under that I gotta please everybody thing. Okay, true confessions. I got my hand up twice. I was raised that way. You have to tuck the whole world in at night or you were a failure. And that's a, a bunch of garbage. Now I'll leave it at that. It's not true. It's not true. So there's always strife. The first place the strife is, is internal. We're always fighting ourselves. And if, and if I take this glass, imagine it's a plastic water bottle and I squeeze it, what's coming out? Water, because that's all that's there, right? I'm sorry, it's not going to be red wine or Diet Coke or milk or anything else. It's just going to be water. And when we have internal strife because we are trying to coexist with a vision from God and a veil that we are hanging on to for our own security in our same spiritual territory, what is happening to us, we have internal strife. And when pressure comes from the outside, strife is going to spill out on Tommy and Rocio when they get too close to me. Why? Because that's all that's in here that's going to spill out. 
So is it possible we don't really walk in full power, full fruit, full anointing, full giftings, full real breath of God obedience because the vision and the veil are trying to coexist and the land cannot bear it. Our land cannot bear that coexistence. Or as Jesus said, well, why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye and you got a log in yours? Well, Jesus, you know, okay, all right. You know, that's when he starts meddling. And so we, let's turn the worship music up louder because I really don't want to have to deal with that. Right. Abram says, if you go to the left, I will go to the right. Oh, my. If you go to the right, I'll go to the left. Lot lifted up his eyes. He saw the valley of the Jordan, verse 9, where it was well watered everywhere, like the garden of the Lord. Whoa. I mean, that's a no-brainer. That's a prime piece of real estate. I'm going right over there. So Lot chose for himself all the valley of the Jordan, and Lot journeyed eastward. And thus they separated from each other. Now, just consider. I'm going to rattle off a bunch of stuff. Lot. There is no record that God ever spoke to Lot. He sent angels to help him. There's no record that God ever spoke to Lot. There's no record that Lot had a vision. There's no record that Lot ever built an altar. Lot, we have no record that Lot ever called upon the name of the Lord. We have no record that God, that, that Lot ever believed God for anything. Lot was simply riding on Abraham's coattail. How can we be so sure? Because Lot chose the valley, listen closely, for himself. The veil will always make a self-centered choice. Ah, I see that. That's good. I'm going to choose that for myself. Sound familiar? I will ascend on high. I will be on the sides of the north. I will, I will, I will. Wow. But Lot apparently had no revelation. So he went towards Sodom, and the word says the men of Sodom were exceedingly wicked and sinners. But the name, even though the valley looked beautiful, the name Sodom means scorched. And it may look good on the outside, but it's scorched on the inside. Now, Lot is leaving, and the second Lot leaves, what does God do? Wow. God speaks to Abram again. And the first thing he says is, lift up your eyes. Lift up your eyes. You got rid of that veil. Man, don't you know God was happy? This is awesome. Lift up your eyes and look. And if you read in the scripture, it says what? North, south, east, and west. Everything you see, I have given it to you and your descendants. And that included the place Lot just went. He didn't say, oh, I look everywhere except what Lot just went. Uh, I'll give you this, but you can... No, 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 you get rid of the veil and God will give you what you thought you had with the veil. If we get rid of the veil, God will give you what you thought you had with the veil that you really didn't have because it's a veil. Amen. So remember Moses, when Moses came down from the mountain, what, what did he have? His face was shining so much he put a veil over it. He was trying to hide the glory of God. People couldn't handle the glory of God. And boy, I'll tell you what, sometimes, you know, we think we're so spiritual. Sometimes we can't handle the glory of God either. Who? that's not on the program. How do we tighten up a little bit? No, 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 no. Let him do what he wants to. Anytime he wants to, any way he wants to. 
So Moses puts this veil over his face so they can't see the glory. Guess what we tend to do? We tend to put the veil over our face so people don't know we don't have the glory. So we tend to do that. Now let me tell you, here's what the Lord said. The veil will never reflect the glory of God. The only thing that reflects the glory is your face because only your face only you the human being you are made in the image of God and only the image can reflect the glory Amen. only the image of God can truly reflect the glory of God but without the veil, we feel vulnerable. I mean, what if you see what I'm really like? It's okay. They always think we're worse than we are. <laughs> well, why do you tell people how old you are? So you guys don't think I'm any older. For heaven's sakes. <laughs> I went through have you see the faults I really have. Then you make them up in your head. They're going to be a lot worse than I would do. <laughs> Isn't that? Come on. Right? Let the veil go. It's not helping. It can't reflect the glory. Only our humanity can reflect the glory. Okay, okay, okay. I get it. I get it. I get it. I'm convinced the veil is not good. How do we get rid of it? You can't. You can't. Thank you. Not really. We can confess. We can lay it down. But in Isaiah 25, verse 7, hear the word of the Lord. On this mountain, he will destroy the covering which is over all peoples, the veil that is upon all the nations. God Almighty destroys the veil, and it's destroyed, according to 2 Corinthians, in Jesus himself. And so, what do we have to do to get rid of it? Well, the first thing we have to do is recognize it's there. I mean, you can't fix a problem if you don't know it's there. So we have to recognize, we have to allow Holy Spirit, reveal what veil is binding us. Reveal what veil is blinding us. Reveal what veil we think we have to drag all over creation because we birth who we are, not what we say. And so if I am dragging a veil, I'm birthing what? Blindness and binding, and I'm putting a veil over everywhere I'm going because that's what I am inside. But if I let the veil go, come on, y'all, it's real simple. Cats have kittens, dogs have puppies, veils give birth to veils, revelation gets birth to revelation, the glory of God gives birth to the glory of God. Amen. <laughs> So we let things go. We let it go. We let it go. Let me read that again. It is so important. On this mountain. Where? The mountain of the Lord. Come and let us go to the mountain of the Lord. To the house of our God. He will teach us of his ways. And we will walk in his paths. Why? For the law shall go forth from Zion. And the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. On this mountain, he will destroy the veil, the covering that is over all the nations. Are you part of the nations? Yeah. The promise then is to you. He will destroy the veil. So what do we do? We embrace the vision he's given us. We humble ourselves and separate from our lot, no matter what it is. We trust, like Abram did, the sovereignty of God. If you go to the left, I go to the right. You go to the right. I, I, he could trust the sovereignty of God. 
Why? He had heard the voice that he had the promise. Then what do we do? We ascend to the mountain of the Lord. We purposely lay the veil down and we allow ourselves to be transformed from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord, who alone can remove our veils. Amen. Let's stand to our feet. that we have that we don't realize we have. Let's just wait before the Lord a few minutes. Let's wait before him. Father, I pray that the power of the Holy Spirit oh my we need the power of the Holy Spirit we need the glory of God to flood this place. We need the revelation of Almighty God to begin to breathe. Holy Spirit, we ask you to take each one of us as individuals. We ask that you begin to teach us, show us, draw us, lean into us as we lean into you. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we simply say we're willing for you to expose in our hearts anything you want us to release to you. We lay our veils down. We lay our veils down. And we trust that you will deliver us. And you will heal us. And you will breathe in us all that we need to know and do and surrender in the name of Jesus. I want everybody right now to make a little holy of holies right where you are. I want you to forget everybody up front. Forget what you think is supposed to happen. Forget all of that. Get along with Jesus. Just whatever you have to do. You may want to sit. You may want to kneel. You may, Whatever you have to do. Please, no talking, no visiting right now. Let's shut ourselves in alone with God. Shut ourselves in. Thank you. 